I wanted to ask all three of you, Scott, um, the fact that, you know, that the three of you are sort of, this is like a, a reuniting from 212. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are about these two guys as coaches when you hire them and Orlando and Michael, what it was like getting your first coaching gig with this guy. So I'll start with Scott, please. Yeah, they were, Dan, they were, they were holdovers from Jim Barker's staff. So, um, wasn't their first job really, I don't think for either of them. Um, I knew a little bit more about Osh as a coach because he had been um, Jim's special teams coordinator and they had great success. We played him in the East final, I think two years prior. You know, that's when Chad Owens was really killing it just on special teams. And, um, so Osh was, was an easy one. Um, with Orlando, I knew him as, from his playing days and he'll tell you, he had a pretty extensive interview. I gave Chris Jones a lot of latitude in the defensive, uh, in the defensive staff hirings. And uh, we, we sat in there with O for, I mean, a long time. <laughs> and he was so patient because he was, you know, it was all really about character, not even X's and O's. You know, can we trust you? What kind of, and um, he's, <laughs> O would finally was like, guys, all I can tell you is I'm a good guy. You can trust me. And, and this is going to work. And, uh, Two of, my, two of my favorite guys in the business, CFL, NFL, college football, whatever. They're great coaches. I only had the, I think the one year with you, right? And and I had, I think, two with, with Osh. Um, but um, I had no doubt that they would go on to be uh, highly successful. Yeah, it was outstanding. I had a, had a, a ton of fun. Scott really set the scene well for the interview process. I was fired up to get on the board and they had three people there reading body language and that and I remember just kind of slamming my hand down saying, I get it. It's got to have to be character first and it, you're going to have to try it or not. And thank goodness he tried it. And uh, that was a uh, one to remember. And I, I just remember, you know, just a sense of pride. You know, I saw how Scott went about his business in his first role and I'll speak for myself. And I know OSHA's built the same way. He may say it different, but you know, I took great pride when Jim Barker was, you know, won the Anna stuck his trophy and was coach of the year. Like, that, that, I took great pride in that. And the fact that Scott was able to, to be coach of the year, like I took great pride in that. I didn't want to let anybody down. And I think that's just something that carried over from my playing days. Like I wanted to not let the person next to me down. And I just, that staff was, I mean, we went to work, we grinded. Uh, we went through, I think a one in five stretch in the middle and you just thought we were five and one. Like we still came to work. Nobody didn't believe in each other. Um, and I know I'm, I'm hitting specifics on memories, but that's really what the general public wouldn't generally get is, is details like that. Um, it's too bad. I hope I get to work with these guys one uh, another time in my coaching career. Uh, great memories. And, you know, just obviously when you when the confetti falls, that's the ultimate goal. Yeah. That's the icing on the cake. But the people were just as good as the confetti. You know, I just. I just happened to rewatch the replay of the of the hundredth, and uh, you know the, Scott's a no BS guy, right? So when Larry Taylor pumps off a couple of returns, the cut eye I'm getting on the sideline and he looks from him, it's awesome. That kind of uh, that kind of accountability um, w was terrific. It certainly helped guide me in in my process. Uh, becoming a head coach, but I wouldn't trade. I wouldn't trade those those couple of years on that staff for anything. It was it was just awesome going to work every single day. Have there been positives for you guys as coaches, whether it's prep or um, you know working on a playbook or things like that? Is, is there anything positive that you've been able to take out of the uh, abundance of time? I guess we've got this year. There are silver linings. Scott said it too, um, and and a bunch of them probably too numerous to to talk about. And also, um, there's the uh, there's the days you wake up and you're just, you know, you're you're so uh, frustrated or disappointed that you're not working um, with your players in a building on the field. Uh, you know, that happens too. That's all just uh, the real life emotion of of where we're at. Um, but of course, you, you you find new things to do and and um, most more beneficial. I would echo the same thing. It's, there's different things like you, you can fill up notebooks and notebooks and keep it all football based. But the reality is 
been able to spend more time with the kids. You know, the garage is probably cleaner than it's ever been. You know, there's just, I learned how my kids cut their apple. Like there's all kind of different things that show up that you're just not privy to. I had my first birthday at home in 22 years. And I know those are small things, but you know, always remember coach is our title, but we're people too. And, you know, our families, I know our kids, if you interviewed our kids, they would be thrilled, I think. <laughs> Maybe not our wives, but our kids are thrilled that we're around, you know, a lot more. So there's, there's the life perspective that we just really haven't had as a player and a coach. You're just really not afforded that. And that's the life we live and what we sign up for. So uh, plenty, plenty of positives and, you know, life's about choices. And if you choose to find the positive things, you'll find it. If you want to find negative, you'll find it. So. Um, I'm just uh, staying optimistic and positive and, and looking forward to 2021. I'll start with Craig. I'm just curious if you've been planning for free agency, even though that you can't re-sign players yet, if you sort of have a ready list of guys you would like back. And on that same note, Cody Fajardo will be going into his last year of his contract in 2021. Is he a guy that you would like to see potentially be extended? Have there been any extension talks there? that's a guy that's tied to you for, you know, the long term in terms of being with the Riders? Yeah, to answer your first part, Justin, we have, Jeremy and I, you know, I just got back to Montana. I've been in, in Regina for most all of this this season. We have talked about our team, who, who we'd like to have back, what their contracts are, uh, what we expect possibly the contracts to look like next year. Um, and the reality is we won't be able to bring everybody back, but we're going to try to bring our, our core of our team back, which I think we can. Um, as far as Cody, that, you know, that's Jeremy's, Jeremy's sort, of, sort of work. You know, he, he's certainly a guy that, that is our franchise quarterback and, and really the leader on our offense. So we're going to try to make sure we have him, have him signed up for the long term. Um, Jeremy and I haven't gotten into specifics on, on Cody yet, but if this is obviously the last year of his deal coming up, we'll certainly want to try to address that and, and moving ahead, make sure we have, have him, you know, under contract and under, under wraps for, for the long term. So that'll be something I'm sure we'll talk about in the new year. Awesome. Thanks, Craig. And then I'll get to Rick in on this. I'm curious if you've had any interaction with Mike Riley and what you feel the relationship is like there since he filed a grievance against the team. The relationship with Mike's um, really good. Um, had good interaction with him um, throughout this summer and this fall. And he's actually had good interaction with uh, our offensive staff. Um, so I'm of the mindset that, uh, that Mike's going to be here. I know there's some business stuff that has to be taken care of, but our full intent is to have Mike here. And um, everything I hear from Mike is that he wants to be in the, uh, uh, wants to be in BC. He originally signed a four-year contract because he wanted to to be here for the long term. So we're gonna make sure we get all that stuff ironed out and um, look forward to having him here in 2021. From your sense, is it really just about business? It doesn't seem like there's any animosity from his side, is there? There's been no animosity from where I sit and from where our offensive coaches sit. Um, the dialogue's been good. We we were totally excited about this year and getting to play football in 2020. Obviously that didn't happen, which was a, a major curveball. But I know just in talking to Mike, um, I know I know he wants to be a part of the Lions. And I know that uh, after sitting out a year, um, just like uh, the rest of us, the football players and the coaches are gonna be excited to, to get back on the field. So that's, that's the mindset right now. There is a business side to it and um, that's on us to make sure that gets ironed out. But like I said, I would be, I'm going to be very surprised if uh, Mike Riley's not, uh, not playing for the Lions. Once the business year begins formally, do you expect to still wear the GM hat or do you think that'll change? If it changes, will you have any input under who the new GM might be? Um, I mean, we're, we'll see how things go. All I'll say right now is we're, we're quite comfortable between um Neil and myself are in Vancouver here with Rick Lollisher, and we also have a football ops department, and we're comfortable with what's going on right now, and we, and we don't think we're missing a beat, so we'll see how this thing goes, um, but I know that uh, 
Um, I know Rick Lawlisher's in on uh, making sure we do whatever gives the Lions the best chance in, in 2021. And um, so far, we're comfortable with where we're at. Uh, this is for, for Dave again. Uh, Dave, how closely have you been watching Alex down in Philly? And how exciting is it for you as a coach and a guy who knows him pretty well seeing him do what he's doing? Yeah, uh, I think I think we're all excited for him, especially because, you know, it didn't really go well for him right away. In fact, he got released. He was really close to coming back to Calgary. And then uh, Philly decided to sweeten the offer a little bit. I think what the most part, all of us just – enjoy seeing these guys get an opportunity well believe in them and and sometimes you know it works out sometimes it doesn't but he's playing well and you know 15 tackles I mean that's a huge number I don't know how many guys get that in, across the league and you know that whole division is is a mess I think Philly's in good shape I think if they can find a way to get some momentum I always feel like they seem to at the end of the year uh they make a run at it but you know yeah I definitely Alex we had on the 2018 we had a little deal where we were uh, watching the 2018 Grey Cup, and he he jumped on, and he's the same guy. He just works hard, loves football, great emotion, uh, plays to me a great. He is unselfish. He just does his job. We're proud of him. You know the whole thing, and I I chuckle is you know Canada has really adopted Alex, and and you know a couple of years ago I'm sure he he got Canadian status, but he didn't feel like he was Canadian. Well, I think Alex feels Canadian. I think yeah, he, he's from Cali. But I really feel like he knows Canada's in his court, and uh, we're all excited for him. What kind of roster churn do you expect from the team that ended your season, uh, you know, in 2019 to when you take the field in 21? I guess I'll start with you, Craig. Well, good, good to see you, Mark. Um, I, I don't, I don't know, I don't have a great answer for that, Mark. I, I will say this: we feel like we're going to have our core group back, but what that, what that means is, is, is has yet to be seen, but I think most of our guys, you know, that we believed in, in 2020, we believe in, in 2021, there may be a few that were right on the edge of, of, of maybe being close to retirement that we may look to get a little younger at, but the, the majority of players that we felt strongly about in 2020, you know, we've contacted these guys, they've, they've been working out, they're doing the best they can to, to be ready to roll. We, we're going to, we're going to push to have that same group signed in 2021. Now, what that looks like, Jeremy and I will sit down. Jeremy knows a lot more about that than I, but I think I think we're going to move ahead in 2021 as if it's the same group, um, and we'll do the best we can when we get to training camp. Hopefully, there there is fitness as as ready to roll in 2021 as we thought they would be for 2020. I guess I'll ask Dave. Same thing. Uh, level of uh, roster churn. You're saving the, the GM till last. <laughs> no, he's got to think about it because he hasn't coached his team yet, so he's got to figure that out. <laughs> playing with me. Um, I think we're going to lose some guys. It's going to be partially salaries, too. You know, some guys may not want to play for what they're going to have to play for. Um, but as Craig said, I think most guys, they're football players, first, first and foremost. You know, the game's too hard, especially, you know, the, up here in Canada. If you're not fully committed, you can't show up and play and, and give me what you need to if you're not fully committed. So I think we will lose a few um, guys that might, for the general fan, it might be a big surprise. Uh, we definitely have contingency plans, but we're hoping, like Craig, that for the most part, the guys uh, being away from ball. And, and to be honest, I, I, I haven't really been out in the real world, but I don't think real jobs are that fun. Uh, I think football is a hell of a job. So I don't think we have to sell our game either. I think our game is really, really at a high level uh, coming off 2019. So uh, I think for the most part, we'll get most of them back, but it'll be tough. And it could be that high-priced veteran or that that guy that just doesn't feel like, um, you know, he's he can give me what he needs to. And uh, that's part of life. And we move on from there. Like these guys said, we don't know for sure what we're dealing with, but we know we want to keep a core group of guys here. We think there's a, a good group. And um, so we're going to be working on able to do that. The one thing I'm, I am kind of excited about and optimistic about is I'm hoping we get some momentum. Craig talked about how we're actually shifting into what's going to feel like a more normal, like we're going to get into the off season, get a schedule announced, 
you know, get to the things like free agency in the draft. And I hope we can all kind of feel some normalcy again and get some CFL momentum going and then, um, and then get to playing again. But we're going to try to retain as much as we can um, and, and see how that goes. But we'll have to see with what, uh, you know, what we're dealing with and how much we can pay people and all that. But um, I'm with Dave. I think football's, I think CFL is a pretty good deal. And, um, you know, we're the people that get to coach and play in it and do all that are pretty lucky. So, um, you know, I'm hoping we can pay people as much as we can and get guys back and then get this thing back on track. A question for Coach Dinwiddie, if I could. Uh, coach, uh, perfectly ordinary first season for you as a CFL head coach. How was it? Well, it was a lot of learning, uh, you know, not a lot of playing, which is kind of the, the tough part about it. Obviously disappointed uh, going into your first year and, you know, things we did in free agency and with the draft, I felt really comfortable that, about the direction our program was going. We knew we weren't there yet. We have to uh, improve our roster and, and those things, but I felt like we, we were a better team going in this season than they had in the past. So, um, you know, it's just a bump in the road. It's, it's, it's frustrating. Um, you know, it's demoralizing at times when you're not, you know, being able to do those things with your staff and your players. And uh, it's just part of life, man. It's just like the rest of the, uh, the world is dealing with a lot harder than we are. I mean, we still have our jobs and, and we're looking forward to play next year. So big picture. Um, it gave me opportunity to, you know, to kind of look into the job in a different aspect and not be rushed going in this season. Where did you go for, for how to deal with this as a head coach? Who did you, who did you lean to? Who did you, perhaps take advice from or sources you drew inspiration or wisdom from? No, I, I got a lot of calls from, you know, um, my mentors in the States and just kind of, you know, ask them, hey, what are some ways I can make this a positive? And so they gave me some information. Then, you know, relying on pinball, um, you know, being able to spend as much time as I possibly can with him. Um, if he feels there's something I'm looking at in a different light, he'll come up and say, you know, what he thinks it should happen. And it's been great to have him as a sounding board and, and how um, – supportive he's been through this whole process and, and then same thing with the MLSC and Bill Manny they've been great to help us with anything we need go a question for Carrie uh, when you'll see your players most of them it will be 18 months after the last game if everything yeah. goes well what will yeah. be tougher in training camp is timing uh, what will be tougher uh, 18 months yeah. later yeah um I mean, it's, that's a big question, you know, and you're, you, I, I think every uh, body has to try to figure it out what, what they need to do. You know, I mean, I don't think no one has, has been in a situation like this where you you've, literally everybody on the team has, has uh, not been together. Um, and, and, you know, there'll be new players as well and, and uh, different dynamics that way. I think the biggest thing is just to make sure that the guys are, uh, uh, able to physically uh, take the, the, uh, the demands of football again. You know, usually when guys are on a certain schedule, so they have the same things that they do going into a season and, and to get them ready for, for the season. And I think uh, if I were to say anything, we're probably going to have to do a little bit more to, uh, to make sure that they're in, in as good a football shape as they can be going into the first, uh, first games. And so, uh, yeah, it'll 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 be a, be different, but uh, but yeah, I look forward to that challenge. Coach in the Argos, you're in a division where the only head coach who's got a defensive background is Orlando, with Lapo and Kahari. You know, they're two offensive guys. What do you like? What what do you take from guys like Paul and Kahari in terms of their maybe offensive uh, principles that you may perhaps. Uh, integrate and still in your offensive attack yeah you're always looking to you know steal some schemes and improve you do it throughout the year just as far as game planning you'll see someone and you'll like their ideas and you'll implement it and it, and it might go into your playbook and be one of your base schemes but you know I, I study all those guys I plan on doing it. I you know Paul's done a great job of you know getting creative in the run game and in this uh, one word plays and get some shots down there in the short yardage so I, you know obviously looking doing some of those things if I can figure out how he taught it. Kahari's done a great job with his quarterbacks. Um, you know, he went there and, and found a way to get Vernon uh, playing at a high level. And, uh, you know, Vernon never had that success until he got to Kahari. So I looked at some things they did, and I thought just, you know, the fact that he was willing to 
risk it, no biscuit kind of Bruce Arians a little bit last year. And they were, they were an aggressive team and he brought that culture to his, uh, to his team as well. So I think, you know, you can always learn from someone and, and involve it into something you do in your scheme. I, uh, this question is for uh, Coach uh, LaPolice. Um, just wondering, uh, through the last uh, couple of weeks and months talking with players, uh, have you gotten a sense that some of the guys um, will think twice about maybe coming back and playing next season? Some guys have started new jobs. Um, is that one of the, the worries, uh, coach-wise, of maybe some guys not coming back? You know, certainly there's always attrition in, 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 uh, in the Canadian Football League. Uh, certainly in my exit, you know, when we knew we weren't having football, um, I tried to do my best to speak to as many players on our roster as possible. Um, from the most part, everyone was disappointed, you know, some pretty frustrated, uh, but understood. And everyone, you know, I would say 90% of the guys were itching to come back. Now, maybe something changes over the course of months, but uh, for the most part, our guys were, okay, I'm going to find my, I'm going to do my best to be able to train and uh, earn a living. And I, I really looking forward to coming back. I, I can, I can recall maybe only one person who said I'm contemplating a, you know, uh, moving on into a different uh, environment or different type of workplace. So I, I think that the appetite for players to play is very good. I mean, it's such a, fun league it's you know as many of the players that come up to this league have uh you, you hear all the players who go down to the nfl or come back and they always just talk about how great of experience it is to, to be able to work in this league and uh, so uh, i think for the most part our players are going to do their best to uh, uh you know certainly continue to entertain it um you know the guys may there may be some guys who get put in a position where do they leave their jobs or continue to play but i think for the most part uh you'll see a high percentage of our players coming back to play you know i, I would say the hardest part uh, you know I, I think it changes for each unit like I, I know um for me personally the hard part is you know certainly with school starting now it's an easier process but it's 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 a different story when you appear at 5 30 in the morning and go to a f football facility and you come home at eight o'clock at night um, when we were preparing for a football season uh, you're trying to do the same thing but you walk down into a office and you hear kids yelling and screaming and you got your like you know it, it's in the back of your mind way more when you're at your own home right so i i think one of the hardest parts is balancing you know, you actually just don't see that. And you thank your wife so much for what they do when you go to the office and you could spend from 5.30 in the morning till eight o'clock at night in a blink of an eye. Where here, there's so much more things you have to help with and you have to help with the homework. And so finding blocks of time to do work or meet with the staff has always been a challenge. It's a little bit easier now that kids are back in school. Um, I, I would say that that's been our probably hardest thing. And then you know, having the ability to, we're still trying to do our best to adapt, improvise, and overcome how we meet and do those things, right? We had meetings this morning with our staff and we just try to work around all those other things. But I think that's been the hardest part. And then the other thing is just being around the players, right? I just miss, just miss the daily interactions or the daily consistency of what you do from day to day with the guys. So.